Hi, everyone. Welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog, and I also host the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. I'm based in New York City, where it's absolutely freezing tonight. We're approaching the beginning of winter, and I imagine wherever you are is probably just as cold, if not colder. So I've got a warm mug of coffee here to power me through the evening, and please feel free to get yourself a similar cup of coffee or tea as you join me tonight for what will be a riveting class on LSAT and law school admissions. So I appreciate you taking the time tonight to focus with me on this ever important aspect of the law school admission process. So the, of course, the biggest thing is that the LSAT has gone digital this year. How many of you, just do me a favor, type in the chat, how many of you have already taken the digital LSAT? either in July or September or October or November. I'm just curious where all of you are at on that. So I see someone said they took October. Someone has not taken the digital LSAT yet. We got another October. So it looks like a few folks have taken the digital LSAT already and some haven't. So the LSAT, of course, has gone digital, is being administered on a tablet, a Microsoft Surface Go specifically, 10 inches, if you want to practice, any old tablet is perfectly fine. A Samsung, an iPad, you could borrow one from a friend just to do a, a couple of practice tests. There are a few on LSAC's website at familiar.lsac.org. If you want to see what it looks like, there are some interesting features about the digital LSAT. You can highlight, you can underline, you can flag questions, you can eliminate answer choices, and bubbling is a total breeze. It takes two seconds rather than slowly filling in an oval with a number two pencil on a Scantron, which is very old school. I'm glad LSAC has finally joined the 20th century, even though we're now in the 21st century. But regardless, we are where we are. The digital LSAT is not all bad, despite some of the tech issues that happened in recent administrations. I'm hoping that it will get better and better as time goes on. And we will discuss the digital LSAT in more length in just a little bit. But for now, I want to have a little fun with you and play some true and false myth versus fact with regard to the LSAT. So true or false, you can't take notes on the digital LSAT. Share your thoughts in the chat. Can you take notes? Can't you take notes? Those of you who have taken the digital LSAT will already know the answer on this, but feel free to cheat and share your thoughts anyway. So let's see, what have we got here? Christina says true. Anyone else, other thoughts here? We have a false, we have another true, a mix of responses. This is kind of a trick question. So can you take notes? In fact, yes, you can take notes, but you cannot take them on the tablet itself. You will have a booklet of scratch paper of about 12 to 14 pages, and you take all your notes there, but you cannot draw freehand on the digital LSAT the way you might have expected to be able to on a whiteboard, for example. So while you are studying for the digital LSAT, I recommend if you're studying out of books, do not write on your books at all. Keep your books clean, which as a bonus makes it easy to reuse them if you want to or resell them if you want to. But more importantly, it's simulating the digital LSAT where you cannot write on the questions. You can only write on your booklet of scratch paper to the side. Again, it's a booklet of 12 to 14 pages eight and a half by 11 paper unlined with a now small LSAC logo on the page. It used to be a much larger logo and it's no longer newsprint. It's now normal, relatively higher quality paper. So get used to that. Of course, it's not unlimited paper, but it is more than enough. You have it for all sections, not just the games. You have it for the logical reasoning and the reading comprehension as well. So all those formal logic, logical reasoning questions where you have conditional statements, you can diagram those by hand on the booklet of scratch paper. And on the reading comprehension, you can also make some notes, whether it's a short summary of each paragraph or simply an articulation of the author's opinion or the main idea, you can do that. So very important to practice like it's going to be game day where you're not writing on the questions, rather on the booklet of scratch paper. For reading comprehension, I recommend that you do, in fact, take some small, simple notes in the margin on your scratch paper. If you want to summarize the passage with 
a, a short couple of words on each paragraph, you can do that. If you simply want to articulate the main idea, you can do that as well. One other thing I want to mention with regard to the digital LSAT is that you want to get used to reading difficult, dense text on the computer screen. So there are two tools I will recommend for that. One is called phrasereader.com. The other is called spreader.com. And what these tools allow you to do is they allow you to copy paste text from any source. You can choose The Economist, you can choose Scientific American, or if you have the digital LSAT PDFs, you can copy paste those into the text field as well on these sites and display that text to yourself at varying or increasing speeds over time to place yourself on a kind of reading comprehension treadmill to get faster and faster as you go. I would definitely recommend that. Of course, if you want to read casually for fun, Scientific and American and The Economist, you can do that. But there are nearly 100 released LSAT official prep tests. And so there's not really a need to go beyond those for additional reading material unless you want to do so in a more casual sense for fun. Now, I have a ton of questions here in the chat, and I know some folks are very interested for me to address them. I've gotten the same question multiple times, so I will go ahead and listen to the, the mob and listen to the requests and address this question. There have been some news reports lately that the logic game section will be removed from the LSAT. Is this true? The short answer is no. The more complex answer is maybe at some vague point in the future. Basically, what happened is that someone, a blind law school applicant, sued LSAC because he contended he was at an unfair disadvantage for solving logic games because you need to be able to diagram to do them well, and if you can't see, hard to benefit from diagramming. He sued LSAC, LSAC settled, and the settlement agreement said that LSAC will conduct research and development within the next four years to develop an alternative to the current logic game section. The plaintiff's attorney, meaning the attorney on behalf of the blind law school applicant, interpreted this to mean that logic games will be removed in four years and replaced with something else. LSAC came back and said, actually, it's only the research and development that needs to be completed within four years. And at some point in the future, they may modify the LSAT, but it's unclear exactly what this will look like. I taught an, a loss, an LSAT prep class on this about a month or so ago where I went into this in more depth. And so feel free to email me and I'll share the link to that where I do analyze the text of different, the different parties. But the short answer is that for any of you applying to law school in the next few years, you will almost certainly not be affected by this change. Instead, the change you should focus on is the digital LSAT specifically. So that's what I'm gonna focus on for tonight. If you want the details on the logic games potentially being removed, contact me for the link to that video where I go into it in more depth. So I know you have a ton of questions that you've presented to me. I will get to them all, but I wanna cover some other general timely issues that have come up recently. So I'm gonna go back to those now. True or false, the January LSAT is too late for admissions, meaning too late for admissions in this current admission cycle. Is it too late? Some people are concerned about this. I've gotten a lot of questions on it. And so I thought it would be worth touching on that a little bit. Let's see what the responses are. We have a lot of falses. Excellent. You're all rock stars. In fact, that is false. January LSAT is not too late. I would not recommend applying later than that for this admission cycle for a couple of reasons. One is that your chances are a little bit reduced. And on top of that, there may be less scholarship money available. But I imagine a lot of you are taking the LSAT in November, just a couple of weeks away, but you may also want to retake in January. And I'm here to tell you, it's perfectly fine to retake in January and still apply this cycle. But if, you, if January doesn't work out or you're not ready by then and you want to go for February or March, I would suggest instead, don't apply this cycle. You can take it in the spring if you want to. You could take it in February if you want to. But I would then suggest applying next fall at the very beginning of the cycle. And the nice thing is, if you take February or March or April, you could then retake in June or July if you want to, and maybe go up a few points, maybe not. But either way, law schools only take the highest score. They don't average multiple scores. So not really a downside to retaking. I recommend actually taking it at least twice because, hey, you could do better. I would never suggest taking it with the plan of taking it again, but hey, you never know. Could be worth it. So thanks for your thoughts on that. Here, I've got another one for you. True or false, the writing sample doesn't matter. 
It's not scored. It's not part of your score out of 180, but some people treat it as a joke. Should they treat it as a joke or should they take it seriously? Again, lots of falses, excellent. The writing sample does matter, but not nearly as much as the scored sections of the LSAT. And correct, Brooke, it does not only matter for non-arts majors, it matters for everyone. It matters most for people who are non-native English speakers or those who may have had lower grades in English or other writing classes than they would have otherwise wanted to, where there might be a question about your writing ability or your English fluency. Law schools do want to see your writing sample. And now that the writing sample is typed rather than handwritten, law school admission officers are much more likely to look at it because they can actually read it. One admission officer from UCLA told me that he could only read one out of 10 handwritten writing samples in the past. So you can imagine how much time he spent on them if there was no chance of being able to read them. And of course, your brain is fried after doing five real LSAT sections. So your, your hands, you're, you're exhausted by the end and you're not gonna do your best writing with the writing sample previously, but going forward, now that it's digital and you're not, you're not, you don't need to do it on test day anymore and you're not doing it at the test center anymore, you can do a better job on it and you will be expected to, to do a better job on it. Are they definitely gonna look at it? Not necessarily, but if they do, you want it to reflect your score, re reflect your ability well. So give it your best shot. I wouldn't stress over it. I wouldn't do 50 practice writing samples, but doing a couple isn't a terrible idea just so that you're, you're prepared and you know what to expect when they actually give you the writing sample whenever you choose to do it. You have up to one year to complete it after your scheduled LSAT test date, but law schools will not receive your LSAT score and meaning that LSAT will not release your LSAT score until you have completed a writing sample on record. If you have previously completed a writing sample, you don't need to do another one. But if you did a handwritten one and you don't think it reflects your true potential, then I would say, yeah, pay the $15 to LSAC. Again, that's one $5, not a lot of money, and do a typed version that better reflects your ability. Let's see, I've got another true or false for you here. True or false, you can prepare for the LSAT in three months. True or false, a lot of people have raised that idea to me and a lot of LSAT prep courses are structured along that timeline. See the responses here. We have a mix of responses here. We have kind of, true, true but does not mean you will do great, true but not ideal, hopefully true, great responses here. And the answer is, I, I would say it's not ideal and it doesn't mean you'll do great. It's not what I would recommend. Can you reach your fullest potential in three months? I would say for most people, no. I typically recommend five to six months from beginning to end in order to reach your fullest potential. Now, do you need to reach your fullest potential to go to law school? Not necessarily. I mean, maybe it would take a year to reach your pinnacle or your, your true highest potential. Does that mean you need to spend a year? Not necessarily. A lot of top scorers do spend six months or more and even up to a year. And it took me a year to go from the low 150s to achieve a 175 on test day. Doesn't mean it'll, it'll, it'll take you that long. And you also may not need to get a 175. But two to three months, I would say is typically not enough. The LSAT is much harder than the GRE or the GMAT or the SAT or the ACT or any other test you've done up to this point. And so it's worth investing the time. And I'll talk a little bit more later about study plans, but there are several stages to them. One stage, the earliest would be accuracy, where you just focus on getting the basics down and getting the questions right. Next is pacing, where you do timed sections to get your rhythm to do those set questions within a set within 35 minutes. Then finally is endurance, doing full length five section timed exams to build that stamina like a marathon. And so that takes a lot of time. And you might spend two to three months just in the accuracy phase, not even introducing timing. It's a long process, much more than students typically expect. But if you want to achieve your fullest potential, which I recommend because that'll get you the scholarship money and get you into better law schools. So the ROI on that is huge, well worth the investment. Here's another one for you. True or false, the LSAT is graded on a curve. 
So we have a mix of responses here. We have some trues, some falses. This is kind of a trick question here. The LSAT is not graded on a curve in the sense that you are compared to everyone else who sat for your exact exam, meaning that you have no incentive to sabotage the person sitting next to you or any of the other people in the room. Rather, the LSAT is graded on a raw score conversion so that basically LSAC pre-equates your exam based on how it was received with the experimentals on previously administered LSATs. Meaning that LSAC tests out questions for future administrations on the experimental section and they calibrate the difficulty level of various sections and they predict what the raw score conversion should be. So for some exams, you could get 10 questions wrong and that will give you a 170 on test day. For other exams, you could get 13 or 14 questions wrong and that will give you a 170 on test day. So minus 14 equaling 170 means that this was a more difficult exam. Minus 10 means that this was a more average exam. And if it was minus nine, that means it was an easier exam. But the raw score conversion is not quite the same thing as a curve. And a 170 on the November LSAT should be considered equal to a 170 on the January LSAT, which is why the LSAT is the truly objective measure in the law school admission process relative to other factors like the GPA, which could vary based on your major, of course, and also based on where you go to college. And that's why the LSAT typically weighs more heavily in the law school admission process than your GPA, because law school admission officers, they don't really know what a GPA of 4.0 means from a random college if they don't know every college in the country or every major in the country or how every professor grades in the country. But because LSAC is a centralized institution and everyone's taking the same exam, they have a rough sense of what it actually means to get, achieve a given score on a particular test administration. So we had a lot of fun with the true and false. We can always come back to it, but there were a ton of questions in the chat that I want to get to here. One's regarding what prep books to use. The best books to use are the actual official LSAT exams published by the Law School Admission Council. They are published in books of 10 and they are available on Amazon for about $20 each. And you can also, if you prefer, you can use PDFs if you have access to those. There are also a few exams on LSAC's site at familiar.lsac.org. They are exams 71, 73, and 74. And there is also the June 2007 LSAT PDF available for free as well. I've linked a big list of those exams in the chat here, all released exams, and there are nearly a hundred of them of which currently 88 of them are numbered, and then there are a handful that are unnumbered. As for other materials, I have a big list of LSAT books on my site as well, including guides, cheat sheets, checklists, and explanations. And so I've linked to those as well. And those are some resources. If you have any questions about them, of course, feel free to reach out. Whatever books you use, you want to make sure that, they are, that you are using real official LSAT questions published by LSAC not simulated questions, not fake questions, because those often contain mistakes and typos and are also otherwise not realistic reflections of the exam. So don't use LSAT for dummies. Don't use a book that says real exam inside only to find out that it's exam number 17 published in 1995. You want something real and recent. If you're studying over a period of six months or more, then you can start with older exams from the 90s, but otherwise, if you are taking the LSAT within the next three to six months, I would focus on exams from the past 10 years or so because the exam has evolved over time and more recent means more relevant. Let's see what else here. How can you manage your time effectively while taking the test? So time management is incredibly important. This refers to, I think, the pacing aspect of what I was saying earlier about study plans. So you have accuracy doing problems on time to learn the basics, then is pacing, which is related to getting the questions completed within a 35-minute timed section. For games, I would suggest doing questions in the order that works for you, not necessarily the order given within a set. So you could do orientation questions first, then local if questions, and finally, global must be true and could be true questions. So you're building a library of hypotheticals, previously valid scenarios, that can help you better solve the global questions. So approaching the order, the questions in a strategic order. For logical reasoning, you have a general order of difficulty 
So you should complete the earlier questions more quickly to build up a time bank to handle the tougher questions later in the section. For reading comprehension, I would approach the global, simple, main idea and primary purpose questions first, then the detail-oriented questions, then the more general inferential questions that require more reading between the lines. In general, my suggestion is do the toughest questions last and handle the lowest hanging fruit first. Everything is worth the same. There's no sense in getting bogged down in a tough question if there may be an easier question later, especially if the later questions may actually help you solve the most difficult questions that even, even might appear slightly earlier. So in logical reasoning, for example, number 26 may be easier than number 19. So you should flag 19, skip it, and come back to it later. Plenty of other great questions here. Someone asking about when to write the LSAT if they plan on going to law school immediately after undergrad. So if you want to go to law school directly from undergrad, then of course you want to apply to law school during your senior year of college. So if you want to do that, I would say ideally, if we could go back in time, depending on where you're at, you could take the LSAT in the spring of your junior year. Let's say if you're going to be, if you're a junior now, let's say you might want to take the LSAT in March or April so that you can retake it in June or July if you want and then apply at the very beginning of the cycle in September, which would be the fall of your senior year. That would be ideal if you're planning ahead early. If you're currently a senior, then I would say, hopefully you've been studying for the LSAT a bit already, you could take it in November or January and then apply immediately after you get your score back. That's my general suggestion on that. And the other thing I'd say is request your letters of recommendation early so that your professors and any employers you have have time to write you a great one. As for what score you need to get into a good law school, what is the cutoff? There are not really hard and fast LSAT and GPA cutoffs for law school, but a 2.0 and a 140 isn't going to get you into any law school worth going to. You typically want a score at least in the 150s and a GPA of at least, let's say, minimum 3.0 and above, ideally. There is a calculator on LSAC's website, I will share with you the link, where you can input your LSAT score and GPA, and it will show you how you stack up to other students at that law school. So it'll show you the school's 25th and 75th percentile medians, and then you can see with your given numbers where you stand. But if you are not yet done taking the LSAT, then everything is theoretical, it's hypothetical, until you have a real LSAT score. And assuming that you're still in college, then you might have some time to pull up your GPA. And if your GPA is significantly lower than you want it to be, but let's say that you are still in your junior or senior year, you might delay applying to law school until you've completed your undergrad so that you have a relatively higher GPA. So let's say if you're a senior now, you might want to finish spring semester and really work hard during spring semester to increase your overall GPA so you can apply with a higher one, which will, of course, improve your odds. I got some questions about specific LSAT prep courses. What do I think of them? Honestly, I would say what matters more is the instructor you have than the general brand of the course. Some companies might have terrible instructors and great instructors, and it completely varies. You want an instructor who has taken an actual official LSAT and scored well on it, I would define well enough to teach the exam as 170 and above. Anything less than that, I think, doesn't demonstrate true proficiency in the exam to the extent that it would qualify you to teach it. Getting a 165 shows that you understand how to apply the strategies, but the 170s means that you understand why the strategies work and you can see the exam from the test maker's perspective. So I would suggest any class you consider taking make sure that you know who the instructor is and you can ideally sit in on a sample class with that instructor so you can see what, they, what they're actually like, make sure that their personality is a good fit for you and that you could sit to them and watch them lecture and teach you for several hours because that's, that's what you're going to be doing. Let's see what else. Someone asking about the digital format and how is it different and similar from the paper format. So, 
definitely if you're taking digital, practice on digital. The LSAT is entirely digital now in North America, but those taking it overseas still have paper. So if you really hate the idea of digital, you could go overseas to take it. I wouldn't recommend that. I would say that's kind of extreme, but that is an option for a few people. If you want to know how similar it is, I would say take the practice ones on LSAC's website. I think some of the biggest differences are, like I said, you cannot draw freehand on the questions themselves the way you could on a piece of paper. And additionally, you can only see one question at a time on the digital format. So rather than seeing all the questions associated with a logic game at once, or all the questions associated with a reading comprehension passage at once, you could only see one question at a time. And you cannot see the entire reading comp passage at once along with the questions. You can either see the passage only and no questions, or you can see part of the passage and a single question. So those are some significant differences, but play around with it to see what it's like. There's no substitute for actually looking at it itself. Let's see, when should you start studying for the LSAT? And what are the main components of the exam? I would say start studying for the LSAT as soon as possible. Again, I recommend five to six months to achieve your fullest potential. And so work backwards from that. If you want to take it in April, start studying now. If you want to take it in September of next year, you could start now or you could start in March. That would be a decent idea. As for the main components, I've covered this at length elsewhere, but there is the logic games, the logical reasoning, and the reading comprehension sections, and they're all worth studying in depth. Logic games is typically the scariest at first, but the easiest to improve upon significantly. Logical reasoning is somewhere in the middle, but since it's half the exam, it's well worth focusing on because any gains you make there are automatically doubled, given that there are two sections. Reading comprehension is the toughest to improve upon significantly, but there is room for improvement there as well. Let's see, got a question here asking about resumes and applications. What do they look for? Well, for your resume, it should, first of all, it should be an academic resume, not a work resume. So if you've been working for a while, you've been in the workforce, that is not the same resume you should use for law school. It should start off with your academic experience, meaning your undergraduate, any master's degrees that you have, as well as any summer study abroads, for example, or externships that you have. And it should be a little bit more detailed than a work resume would be. And of course, no typos, perfectly formatted, reverse chronological order. You should be consistent in all of your formatting with periods, commas, format for date, month, year, things of that nature. It should have your LSAC account number on it. It should have your full name and address on it. It should typically be limited to one page, except in extraordinary circumstances. If it's more than one page, you better have a very good reason for it. And every page, of course, should have your name, address, and the LSAC account number in case the pages get separated or something. As for what they're looking for in your application, your application is, is quite broad and includes a lot of things. I'm not going to laundry list all of the parts now, but it should certainly indicate why you want to go to law school and that you have a real understanding of what law school is like and what the practice of law itself is like, not simply media portrayals, for example. What's the most important part of admissions? Well, I'll list them in you know, a rough general order from most important to least. LSAT's most important, GPA is next most important, and then all the other soft factors pale in comparison. The soft factors would include your personal statement, your letters of, letters of recommendation, optional essays and addenda, your resume, your character and fitness statement, and that's, that's pretty much it. Those are the, the most important aspects of it. I would say after LSAT and GPA, the personal statement is probably the most important. Like I said, that's where you want to include why you want to go to law school. And of course, this should be extremely well written, no typos, no diction errors. It should be your best writing possible. You should start writing it well in advance. And you should have several people read it over, but it should also retain your personal voice. Tell it using anecdotes is good. Show, don't tell. And don't laundry list your resume. Pick one or two big anecdotes and expand on them and use them as jumping off points. It should be personal in nature. And you do want them to like you at the end of the process. And it should, of course, include things they couldn't learn about you elsewhere and things that only you could share. 
And of course, you want to be memorable. This is a tall order, of course, and everything depends upon the specifics. There are no topics I would say are totally off limits. It's all about how you write about it rather than what you write about. So many great questions here. Let's see what else. Kaylee's asking, how long a period of time should you study for the LSAT? How many hours per day? And what if you're in school full time? I would say on average, if you have other obligations like work or school, I would say a minimum of 10 to 15 hours per week on average. This could vary by day, of course. Some days you may not have any time to study, and then you could make up for it most likely on the weekends. I rec would recommend at most five to six hours in a single day. Typically would be a weekend, or if you're studying full-time, could be any day with frequent breaks. And if you're working full-time, I would say fit in an hour before work, during lunch, if you have downtime at work, and then of course after work. I would try to avoid studying at home because then there are too many distractions like Netflix, friends, family, significant others. And once you switch into your PJs, you're much less likely to actually get any studying done. So I would say get to work or school early and study in a conference room or the library and stay at work or school in a conference room or library to study more before going home. If conference rooms and libraries are not options, I would study at a coffee shop nearby. But once you get home, it's much more difficult to actually get the studying done. Let's see more questions here on admissions. Should, there, should an applicant bring up their desire to work in a particular field of law if they have no prior work experience within that field. So let's say you want to do environmental law, but have no background in environmentalism. Totally fine. If you have a specific field that you want to study, that you want to study, you can certainly mention it. You don't need to have evidence for why you want to do it, although it's or prior experience in that area to support that, although it's nice if you have it. But law schools do understand that your reasons for going to law school may change. You might start off in environmental law and then end up working for the big corporations in big law afterwards. It's a common path, not the one that we would hope for you, but it does happen, of course, and it's understandable. So you can mention it, but don't feel obligated to do so because things do change over time. You might find that you take an environmental law class and you don't like it at all. You might like the idea of it, but the practice might not be nearly as interesting to you. But instead, you might find tax law riveting and you want to do that instead, totally fine. So don't feel obligated to do it, but if you do want to do that, I would say, the way you might support that is going on the law school's website and mention to them that you have, that you're very interested in studying under X professor who teaches Y class and you've sat in on that class when you visited the law school or you've emailed with that professor. You don't have to have those things, but they're nice to have that show that you have shown a demonstrated interest in that law school specifically and that you've gone the extra mile. It's a nice thing to do if you can. So many other questions here. Someone's asking, can you, do you have a LSAT score choice? Meaning, can you choose a specific score to send to law schools like the GRE? I honestly don't know too much about the GRE specifically, but for the LSAT, there is no score choice. All scores are sent to law schools. So if you took it a year ago and got a, one, and got a 140, then you retook it and you got a 160, that's totally fine. Law schools will see both the 140 and the 160, but no big deal. Law schools do not average multiple scores. They only take the highest. And is it better to have only the 160 than both a 140 and a 160? Yeah, it certainly is better to have only a 160, but not a big deal. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Someone's asking about attending law school in England versus Canada. They're completely different law schools and the admission process is totally different. The systems of law are certainly more similar between England and Canada than the US and Canada or the US and England. But I'd say it really depends on where do you want to live? Where do you want to work? To me, that would dictate where you end up actually going to law school. And that's not a decision that I can make for you. I would say you want to do your own research and make your own life decisions on that. I'm more familiar with the U.S. admissions in particular. 
someone's asking what's the, what's the lowest LSAT score accepted by top 14 law schools in the US. I would say you probably want to have at least mid to high 160s for the top 14, but it does relate to, of course, your GPA as well. And that LSAT GPA calculator from LSAC will give you more specific numbers than I can off the top of my head about what will make you competitive there. Ranjit's asking, should you take a gap year before law school? If you want to. I wouldn't make life decisions based on what you think law schools are going to want you to do. If you want to do a gap year and you have a good reason to do it and you have good plans for it, then by all means, be my guest. Go ahead. But if you're going to just sit around and watch Netflix or play video games, that's, of course, not a good use of your time, at least as far as law school admissions is concerned. So I would say it's really based on what you want to do. And if you're going to do something great, that's fantastic. Then you could make a killer personal statement talking about what you did. If you got some great work experience in the field of law, that would be close to ideal, I would say. But Spend it, spend it how you like, because honestly, once you finish law school and you start working, you're probably not going to ever have that much free time again until you retire, decades from now, most likely. So make the most of your time, but enjoy it. Well, so let's say someone's asking, assuming that you're spending five to six months to, to reach your fullest potential on the LSAT, how many hours should you spend studying and how to spread it out? I've touched on this a little bit already. But I would say, don't stress too much about any one particular day and don't try to cram it. When you're studying full-time over the course of five to six months, it's easy to burn out. So take plenty of breaks, take some days off here and there, and don't feel like you need to do too much on any particular single day. The LSAT is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's about gradually absorbing the content of the exam and the methods of reasoning over a long period of time. The LSAT is an exam of pattern recognition, not memorization. And so if you want to complete at least 30 to 40 exams, some of which you would do as individual sections, some you would do by, of questions by type, others you would do as full-length timed exams, that's great, but gradual. So slow and steady wins the race on this. And I do have a series of LSAT study plans that actually break down for you my, re my general re recommendations on how to prepare for this when you're self-studying. And basically, these study plans are based on the idea of what I call the LASER approach to LSAT studying. LASER is an acronym standing for Learning, Accuracy, Sections, Exams, and Review. The LASER approach to LSAT studying. Learning is basically learning theory, reading textbook chapters, building a strong foundation in the different question types. Accuracy is doing questions by type, drilling them to learn what is a strengthening question asking for versus what is a flaw question asking for, and so on. Sections is individual timed 35-minute sections to focus on your pacing. E is for exams and endurance, doing full-length five-section timed exams. And then finally, R is for review, which is the most important part in my opinion, but often the most neglected. And for this, it's about doing fewer exams and reviewing them in more depth. Specifically, where did, you mis where did your misunderstanding stem from? Was it in the stimulus for logical reasoning? Was it in the question stem? Or was it in the answer choices? If it was in the stimulus, was it that you didn't know the conclusion? Was it that it was worded in a difficult way? Was it that the you didn't like the topic? Whatever it may be, look at that. If it was the question stem, was it that you did not properly ID which question type it was? then you might need to work on your recognition of question stems. If it was in the answer choices, what was tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it and what ultimately made it wrong? And what was discouraging about the right answer that pushed you away from it, but what ultimately made it correct? This is worth taking a lot of time. Let's say that you were scoring a 170, which is a fantastic score. That might mean you got about 10 questions wrong, but there would be another 10 to, 10 to 15 questions that you guessed on or got lucky on or that you weren't 100% sure on, but it could have just as easily gone the other way the next time around. If that was the case, then you've got about 25 questions to review, assuming you had a 170. And by definition, most people are getting below 170, which means that there are even more than 25 questions to review. And even spending 10 minutes per question with 25 questions, that would take, if my math is right, about four hours. That's a lot of time. 
So you cannot do timed exams every single day. That will lead to burnout and that will not give you enough time to also review the exams that you're doing. So if you're taking the LSAT in January or November, whatever it is, don't do a timed exam every single day. Do at most typically two timed exams per week along with detailed review of those exams and that will be more than enough. If you ID weak areas to focus on, you could drill those on the side, but two exams a week is a lot of work. I certainly wouldn't recommend doing more than that. Plenty of other great questions here. So let's see, can being a STEM major be an advantage when you're applying to law school? I would say so, definitely. I think that being a STEM major is unique. Most pre-law major, most pre-law applicants have majors in the humanities like political science or economics and or criminal justice. And so STEM is unique. Of course, you want to have a good GPA in it. So I would definitely keep that GPA up if you can. And if you do want to practice law in a STEM related field, law schools do love to hear that because there's a big demand for that in the market for employment on that. So I would certainly talk about that if that's the case for you. Let's see other questions here. Are there classes I would recommend an undergrad take for law school? No, there is no particular class that you need to take for law school and there's no particular major that you need to have for law school. Any major is perfectly fine. You can major in English, you can major in physics, you can major in, uh, let's see, uh, underwater basket weaving as a, as a joke, but like you can major in literally anything. I would say a more rigorous major is typically looked upon more favorably, but you also want to have a good GPA. And so if you're really interested in math, but you're terrible at it, I wouldn't take a ton of classes in math because your GPA will suffer. And of course, getting a 4.0 in math is probably harder than getting a 4.0 in English based on my assumptions about grade inflation. But unfortunately, numbers are numbers and law schools do care about their admissions index for the US news rankings. And unfortunately, GPAs are equal regardless, considered equally regardless of which major they come from at least from the analytical perspective. So I would, I would not take too many classes in difficult areas if they will harm your GPA significantly. Maybe one or two, but maybe you want to audit them instead, at least if, they won't, if, that, won't hurt your, if you, that won't hurt your GPA. For T14, I did say the minimum was mid-160s, not mid-150s. I, I don't think that mid-150s LSAT scores would get you into a top 14 unless you had an outstanding LSAT score and you had some sort of connection there. And again, law schools do not favor applicants from any particular major. Any major is perfectly fine, but it should have some minor degree of moderate degree of rigor to it. So underwater basket weaving was a joke. I think that you should have some sort of reasonably serious major that's respectable, that you wouldn't be embarrassed to tell other people about. Let's see what else here. Should you write an addendum if your score is below the school's median or below the 25th percentile? If it'll make you feel better. You could write an addendum. That's what I typically, the answer I typically get from law school admission officers. But the truth is that the numbers are the numbers and excuses in an addendum won't necessarily do you a lot of favors, unfortunately. They do have their own school's ranking to maintain. And if your numbers are too low, there's not really much they can do about it. So if your GPA is not where you want it to be, then the best thing you can do is get a high LSAT score to counteract it. And that's, it's probably easier to get a high LSAT score if you have a low GPA than to get a high GPA if you have a low LSAT score because your GPA is the culmination of three to four years typically, and your LSAT score is earned in one or two days depending on if you retake or not. So if your GPA is not where you want it to be, focus on getting that high LSAT, high LSAT score. And if you can't get a high LSAT score now, then study really hard and retake it so that you can. Ultimately, there's not a real substitute for getting that high LSAT score. And if something goes wrong on test day, whether it's your fault or not, so let's, let's say the fire alarm goes off or the tablet malfunctions, you can write about it in an addendum, but ultimately the schools need that score to accept you or to give you more scholarship money. Got to follow up on that laser approach to LSAT studying. If you're applying that method, should you jump straight into the questions or should you start off with reading textbooks? Ultimately, the study plan will tell you what to do, but the idea is you 
the, again, the five phases are learning, accuracy, sections, exams, and review. So phase one is learning the theory, which involves building the foundation, familiarizing yourself with the various aspects of the exam, the different question types, the different sections, and so on. So that would involve reading textbooks first before jumping into questions. Alternatively, you could watch videos and you could watch my video lessons, which go over the basics of the exam, all sections, games, reasoning, and reading comprehension. I break it down step-by-step, bit-by-bit, so that you know exactly what to do and what not to do every single day over the course of your prep. I have hundreds of videos laying out the basics, and so you could jump right in starting with games, then reasoning, then reading comprehension to build the foundation first before doing several questions. The mistake I typically see from students is doing exam after exam, day after day, measuring your results, being happy or sad about those results, and then moving on. This is inefficient and burns through valuable practice material. Instead, I would suggest building that foundation, then doing questions by type, then doing individual time sections, then full-length exams, and reviewing those, doing fewer questions and reviewing them in more depth, but only after you have built that foundation first by learning the basics of what the exam involves. If you simply do exams without learning the basics, it'll be like taking a diagnostic in a foreign language which, that you've never studied before, which is going to go terribly for you, of course, because it's testing on something that you have not learned yet. It's like if you took a diagnostic in Arabic or Japanese, when you have no prior familiarity with that language, then of course, it's not going to go well for you. You've got to learn the basics first and start off with simple, accessible material first. I would not give you the toughest pattern or circle logic game when you haven't even done a simple ordering game first. So start with the easiest stuff and move forward from there. In my study plans, I have you do the easiest ordering games, then the moderate ordering games, then the most difficult ordering games, then easy grouping, moderate grouping, and difficult grouping, and so on. So going from easy to hard, within each category to build your momentum and build your morale as you go so that you're not giving yourself anything too challenging too early because otherwise it'll just be discouraging. You don't really need that because the LSAT's hard enough as it is. Got a question from someone taking the exam in two weeks. Should this person focus on practicing sections and rereading textbooks or just taking more exams? I would say if you have the time, two timed exams per week, along with detailed review. If you want to do more than that, or you can only do one timed exam per week, totally fine. On the other days, you could do some individual sections and some review of weak areas. So let's say if you're having trouble with parallel questions or weakened questions, you could read chapters on those types or watch videos on those types, maybe do a dozen or two questions of that type afterwards if you want, or if you have particular trouble with science reading comprehension passages or grouping games, you could do some sections or questions involving that type in particular to drill it for extra practice alongside doing more exams. But I do want you doing ultimately at least 10 timed exams by test day, ideally, so that you, so that test day will be just another run through for you. That's nothing especially new or difficult for you from an endurance perspective. If you have not done close to 10 exams yet, don't worry. I wouldn't load them all up into the next two weeks. I would instead try to really work really hard to do two times exams per week over the next two weeks to get as many under your belt as is reasonably possible. But I wouldn't try to do more than that. Let's see what else. What other questions have I not yet addressed here? Someone asking, can you go from a 120 to a 175? That's a tall order. I don't know that's possible for most people. It would take a tremendous amount of work over a very long period of time. I would certainly suggest closer to one year than two or three months. I can't say I've ever heard of a particular example of that, but I wouldn't entirely rule it out. I don't want to tell you that it's not possible, but it'll take a tremendous amount of work. And I would suggest going from getting your hands on every single LSAT ever released and devoting and investing a massive amount of time to learning this exam and arm yourself with the best resources possible because it is a lot of work. 
what's the best thing a first year student can do if they plan on going to law school? So if you are, I assume you mean first year in college, that you're a college freshman. If you are, I wouldn't worry too much about studying actual LSAT material yet because you still have your entire undergraduate GPA ahead of you. I would focus a lot on building strong study habits and study skills so that you can get the best undergraduate GPA possible and read some books on formal and informal logic. Maybe take a general philosophy class to acquaint yourself with difficult, dense text and the same style of reading that you will be doing on the LSAT and enjoy college, first of all, but get your GPA up and keep it as high as possible. Then maybe in sophomore or junior year, if you still want to go to law school, because your plans may change, of course, then maybe get your hands on a couple of the LSAT books, get your hands on a few books on informal logic. I really like the book, A Rule Book for Arguments by Anthony Weston. That is a, a very short book that's very similar to The Elements of Str Style by Strunk and White. It's a short book, just a little bit over 100 pages, and it, it acquaints you generally with the different types of arguments and flaws you typically see on the LSAT, and it's a good way to get, dip your feet in the water. And then if you like that and you're still interested in law school, then get all the old LSAT exams and gradually start working through them using that laser approach that I recommended. I got a question about if you go to law school in Ontario, can you practice law in the US in states like California? So there are different systems of law. If you want to practice law in the US, I would suggest typically going to law school in the US if you choose to go to law school in Canada, you do still need to practice to be admitted to the bar in any state where you want to practice. The U.S. is a is more like a federation where you have different individual states with different bar exams. There is the multi-state bar. There's also the California bar and the New York bar and several others. I'm not totally acquainted with all of them, but you will at some point need to be admitted to the bar in a particular state. And you will need to know about the intricacies of the law in that state in the U.S. system of law in general, which I think is somewhat different from the system in Canada. I'm probably not the best person to ask on this because it's not really my focus, but I would ask law school admissions in these different states about what the requirements are, but it's based on your career goals in part, which are beyond the scope of what my familiarity is. All right, well, we, we've been going for quite a while here and I want to be conscious of your time. I do have one more question here I will address and then... Any follow-ups or anything I didn't get to, please feel free to email me and I'll do my best to get to them over email. I apologize that I can't get to everything tonight, but there have been a lot of great questions and I appreciate your time. Claire is asking, when you're just starting to study, should you alternate between the three different sections or start with one and focus on it? I typically suggest starting with logic games first because it's the most difficult at first, but it is the easiest to improve upon significantly. So I'd start with logic games gain a basic familiarity with that, then introduce logical reasoning while still staying fresh on games, and then mixing and reading comp while still, mixing, while still studying games and reasoning on the side. So I suggest focusing on one, but still mixing in the others here and there. I wouldn't do only one at the exclusion of all others. You could rotate between them de depending on whether you get exhausted or tired of one particular section. Ultimately, I don't think it matters too much, but I like having a primary focus and then a secondary focus to mix it up a little bit, but still have a focus in general on one area because that way you can more easily see the patterns between different question types. I have one question asking me to repeat that book I mentioned. It's a rule book for arguments by Anthony Weston. So that's pretty much all we have time for tonight, but I appreciate all of you coming and investing in yourselves on this very cold winter night here with me. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out if you need anything at all. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care. Have a good night, everyone, and thank you for joining. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them, and feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.